the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. Practical Psychology for Today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, voiced by David Alt. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from Neglected Aspects of Sufi Study by Idris Shah. This audio has been made available by the Idris Shah Foundation. The Sufi Abu Sa'id and the philosopher Ibn Sina, known to the West as Avicenna, once met. When they parted, the Sufi said, What I see, he knows. The philosopher said, What I know, he sees. If you take this to mean that philosophy, which includes the scientific and intellectual attitudes, can arrive at the knowledge which the Sufi is said to have, you will not be at variance with some Sufi authorities who have said that some of the things that Sufis know are arrived at by thinkers in the end. And certainly many thinkers have been surprised at how many things about the products of intellectual work Sufis have known. But you should note two points here and noting them is the sort of exercise which one may often find in a Sufi school. 1. The quotation about the Sufi and the philosopher does not say that each knows everything that the other knows, calls knowledge. And 2. The philosopher arrived at his knowledge through the pursuit of philosophy, not by the analysis of Sufis and Sufism. The scholar must stick to his methods and his assumptions, and get what he can through them. It is probably because a Sufi can only instruct in Sufism, and because only a Sufi can instruct in Sufism, that so many scholars have made what must have seemed to their associates at times the ultimate sacrifice in pursuit of knowledge. Like the great theologian Al-Ghazali, they have become Sufis. So far, however, for some reason which you may care to consider, we still have no record of any Sufi who has become instead, a scholar. Sufism, in striving to establish and maintain its own teaching system, is often regarded as being in opposition to tested and useful learning procedures, especially in declining to reveal reasonably requested information for no easily understood, much less generally accepted, reason. Why is this? All cultures assume, until something to the contrary is established, that it is possible to learn anything which has to be learnt by the methods which are current in those cultures. This tendency ranges from the New Guinea method of applying sympathetic, imitative magic in making cargo ship models to get cargo from the West, to the contemporary Western habit of trying to learn Eastern systems of thought by breaking them down and swallowing a piece at a time in a linear fashion, to the attempts I have seen among some Orientals to learn the beauties of literature, including Shakespeare, by committing it to memory and reciting it in a monotone. Thus, any attempt to state that there are special ways of learning which are not known to your audience is often interpreted by such an audience as a challenge. It challenges their customary patterns. The responses to a challenge of this kind include a. Rejection, B. Indifference, C. Depression, and an anxiety to change completely to get into the new and putatively superior pattern. For the moment, we may ignore the first two responses and can discuss the third. In our tradition, when we are dealing with the increasing of human capacity, we do not deal in instant conversion, in imitation, in linear thought or in gobbets of attractive information. Still less can we, any more than any other true teaching organisation, deal in the induction or assuaging of anxiety, though the latter is standard procedure for cults. Least of all do we deal in emotional vagueness or plunging into ecstatogenic processes. We do not expect people to abandon their conditioning or their customary ways of doing things. How, then, do we facilitate the means to learn while not disturbing the usual patterns? In just the same way that people teach anything that you cannot do already, we help to teach you something, as a skill is taught, which continues side by side with the existing behaviour patterns. 
while it may be said that in some senses nobody who learns something is ever exactly the same afterwards, this doesn't mean to say that you have to become, as it were, someone or something else to study Sufism. It is the Sufi task to give you the means to exercise new and superior functions. While you are acquiring such capacities, you must, as does any learner in any other field, continue to live a normal life and be a normal person. Normal here means to be a member of your social reference group. If, as an analogy, you are a baker and learning to become a candlestick maker, you would continue your baking and practice, in your available time, candlestick making. You would, of course, not try to make candlesticks with the skills and materials used in baking, except for employing a few correspondences, like the capacity to coordinate. Al-Ghazali, the Persian, in his Alchemy of Happiness, tells how a scavenger collapsed from the unfamiliarity of the scent when he was walking in the street of the perfumers, and how it took a former scavenger to discern his state and its remedy, so that he could apply the indicated procedure of holding something filthy under the scavenger's nose until he revived. Like that scavenger, people in the ordinary world become bemused and ineffective if they are exposed to things from another dimension. They are brought back to reality by returning to customary patterns. If the scavenger wants to become, say, a perfumer, he has to be exposed by degrees to sweet odours. At some point he will be able to operate in both worlds, having learnt through practice how to discern both smells. The challenge to the scavenger was the blast of unadulterated perfume from the perfume seller's shops. The scavenger had not had the opportunity of being exposed to perfume in the right quantity, quality and other circumstances. He had therefore in fact been assailed by the perfume, and he collapsed. Like many people faced by the straightforward claims of esotericists, he might have become bemused, anxious, even desperate to shun garbage collecting to become a perfumer or perfumed person himself. But could he have done it only in the time, at the place, and in the way that he himself demanded? Certainly not. Anxiety or impatience are similar to feelings experienced in any situation where people have themselves made random assumptions about how much time they need to do something, or how little time they may have left in which to achieve something. It is they, in such a case, and not the school or other source of expertise, which is saying what the curriculum should be. Does such a back-to-front situation not surprise you when you look at it straight? The reading of selected passages from books, including Sufi books, those which, for example, stress questions of haste and urgency, originally addressed to people in specific places, at special times, for appropriate purposes, this is no way to learn about one's own situation. Yet the fault frequently lies in the learner who is not seldom inefficient, greedy or inadequately prepared. He is not listening to the teacher or not looking at the whole of the picture. If he was, he would find that patience is spoken of as tellingly as urgency. What kind of a cook, say, would develop if someone were to read cookery books but only took heed of the passages which mentioned vanilla or fat or even soups? We must note here that a lot of, as it were, good potential cooks don't misinterpret our books at all. Equally important, of course, is the need for the teachers to make this plain, if they are dealing with such backward learners as those who might address themselves to this particular subject in such a bizarre manner. But the teacher is not under any obligation to persist in demanding a changed normality in his students if they will not, or cannot, give him or his materials the kind of attention which they already give to every other subject which they study. Effectively, though not necessarily in appearance, those with psychological blocks to entering Sufism are not students at all. If there is to be a transaction or a contract between the two parties, both sides must keep to it. Certain pitfalls in the way of the student who wants to apply himself to Sufi matters can be noted, 
though I have never seen them summarized or even isolated in print, and this in spite of the fact that at the last count it was found that over the past 50 years in the major Western countries, one book or monograph on Sufism has appeared on an average of every 14 days. So I am condensing three common reactions to Sufi materials, and then jumping rapidly ahead as a final statement to the ultimate situation of those who have, in fact, learned. There is a Sufi principle, al mujazu kantarat al hakika the phenomenal is the channel to the real, as I mentioned earlier. Sufi teaching is affected through imposed or calculated experience and training about how to benefit from experience. People are subjected to written materials in a literary phase of Sufi activity, which are designed to strike them in such a way as to allow the mind to work in a new or different manner. Sufi circles, their members carrying on all manner of, often seemingly mundane or irrelevant tasks, are settings for seeking the imposition and tasting of experience. The words, the actions, even the inaction of teachers are a further form of impact teaching. The content of Sufi literature and contact also enable the student to obtain impacts suitable to his state from what are, to others, simply some of the ordinary events of the conventional world. He can see them differently and profit from them more extensively, while still retaining his ability to cope with events in the ordinary world on its customary more limited levels. Because the foregoing is generally not properly understood, there are three, not one, usual reactions to Sufi offered experience to be found. 1. The individual becomes a wiseacre. Instead of profiting from the Sufi impact, he learns how to deal with it, answering back, as it were, to frustrate the impact. 2. He becomes hopelessly indoctrinated, obsessional, a believer in Sufism who is nothing other than a sensationalist. And three, he or she is able to observe and to feel a special function of the Sufi impact on himself, on his fellows, in literature and in other areas. He can detect and profit from this activity in many different ways, without being imprisoned by method or associations. It is this last response which, for the Sufi teacher, signals the emergence of the learning function, the enlightenment, without which no further progress is made. It is at this stage that the student can at last make sense of all that has gone before, can profit from his past efforts. If he can anticipate that this is the true sequence of events, he will, even before he reaches it, gain the confidence and stability to continue without constantly trying to get paid as he goes along. In all other systems, there is an anxiety to cash in, to get something, to feel, to know, to be, to experience, to attain certitude. This is what we call getting paid as you go along. With the Sufi, you do not, however, get paid twice. There is a choice open to all, Choose the Sufi opportunity if it comes your way, but at the expense of using it as a source of emotional stimulus. Alternatively, choose a system which promises thrills, chills and spills, stimuli as you go along, and find nothing else. It is the understandable clamour for instant or constant stimuli from the consumer which has brought into being those allegedly Sufi but really concocted systems which offer the emotional junkie Sufism plus kicks. Long studies are sometimes needed before the seeker becomes a Sufi. But if Sufi teaching systems are generous in supplying materials, they are parsimonious in one sense. At the end of the day, the development of Sufic understanding makes real the effect of all that has gone before. Sufis do not supply, for the learner, materials, experiences even, which will be wasted. So at the end of the day, everything fits into place. So finally is the economy of this teaching balanced that people are sure to benefit from what efforts have been expended. But if these efforts are not properly carried out, others, not the person who makes them, 
will be the beneficiaries. This podcast is copyright 2018, the Idris Shah Foundation.